Motion to reconvene the open meeting. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Um, we have a presentation to start the meeting tonight in regard to the 2015 Pat Quinn Classic. And the presenters are Larry Hayes with Burnaby Minor Hockey, Nancy Small with Tourism Burnaby, and Jennifer Scott, Sport Burnaby. Come on forward. Hi, Nancy's my hiding. Hi, I'm Jennifer Scott. I am the Senior Manager for Sport Burnaby with Tourism Burnaby. And in my role, I work to create and attract sport events into the city that have both a social, economic, and sport benefit for the community. One of the projects I had the great privilege of working on the past two years was the Pat Quinn Classic. And I worked alongside my colleague Larry Hayes to really re-energize the existing Burnaby Bantam Hockey Tournament that had been running for 52 plus years. The 2015 event was delivered uh, in Burnaby in December this year and it was, to be honest, it was an unqualified success. It was, uh, we, we were able to knock it out of the park based on all the feedback from our stakeholders, the athletes, the parents of the traveling teams and all our, a variety of our, our partners in the delivery of the event. And that success was born out of a partnership in the teamwork that we had with the city of Burnaby. And that goes for the elected officials in the room. It goes to Dave Ellenwood's team at Parks and Recreation Department and to the frontline staff who really poured time, energy, and all their expertise into this event to, ins to ensure it was a success. The 2015 tournament had 32 teams, sorry, 34 teams. One of them was, traveled all the way from Japan. We had seven teams from the U.S. We had nine from outside the Lower Mainland. That was about 680 athletes competing in our community for four days. The final championship game, we had the notable Mark Donnelly singing O Canada and Danny Boy, and that game was broadcast uh, across the Shaw Network, which was 52,000 people viewership across B.C. Every single game was webcast, and that was picked up by about 1,500 people, mostly in North America and then a pocket in Japan, as you can imagine. There was a lot of social media activity. The media really ran with the story, and we had coverage in Burnaby Now, uh, BC Hockey Hub, uh, Hockey Now, and uh, our friends at Global really ran with the vision of the event. In addition to doing a um, in-studio interview with Councillor Volko and Cliff Ronning, they also came down and did a live remote and then had two stories in their actual sports broadcast. So those are all very key measures of success for this tournament. Uh, but it, and, and it will speak volumes to what we're able to do year over year as we grow this tournament. But I wanted to turn it over to my colleague Larry to really speak to what this event meant for Burnaby Minor Hockey Association, their parents, their administration, and most importantly, their athletes. Thanks, Jennifer. And I just want to uh, reiterate, reiterate what Jennifer had to say about uh, thanking the City, uh, the uh, Parks Commission, Parks Department for uh, their uh, uh, unlimited support, really, for uh, the revitalization of this, uh, this tournament. As Jennifer had said, uh, this uh, tournament, uh, in its uh, previous form as the Burnaby Bantam Tournament, has uh, been going for 52 years in the city uh, with the Burnaby Minor Hockey Association as the host. I have not been there uh, for the 52 years, but I've been there for almost half of those years looking after this tournament, and it was really time for a revitalization of this tournament. And uh, in, in coming up with a partnership with, uh, firstly, uh, the uh, Burnaby, and uh, and of course, uh, increasing and enhancing our partnership with the city, uh, it really made for a, uh, an amazing event. And uh, it was something that Burnaby Minor Hockey needed. I think it was something that the sporting community needed. And it, it was certainly something that uh, those hockey fans uh, really, really cherished to have, uh, be able to come out and see some top quality hockey like we have had in the past with this tournament. Um, I wanted to just share a, uh, an unsolicited email that we got uh, with the Burnaby Minor Hockey Association from a parent 
of, uh, of a younger player from Burnaby Minor Hockey, which sort of sums up what we were trying to do with this tournament. Uh, this is a mom who just says, I'm writing to share the experience from the Pat Quinn tournament during the, win during the winter break. It was so great to see such an international tournament at our home ice rinks. My son, Jer Jerome, uh, who plays for the H4C4 Bulldogs, which are eight-year-olds, enjoyed watching and cheering Burnaby Bulldogs at one of the Bantam A games. Uh, after we watched a Pee Wee A Elite game, and then on the last day of the tournament, came back to Burnaby Lake Arena to see some final games. Watching these high-level players in international tournament at our home rink was so inspiring and an amazing experience. <coughs> I have a few photos during the tournament at Burnaby Lake Arena, including my son Jerome meeting Japan Samurai players after the game. It was so impressive that we could see these players from overseas in Burnaby. We look forward to the next Pat Quinn Classic Tournament and appreciate Burnaby Minor Hockey Association's hosting such a great tournament in our hometown. And I think that, again, really sums up what uh, the Burnaby Minor Hockey Association feels about this partnership. Um, were there some growing pains? Of course. Uh, it was some big changes after a tournament, like I've said, that's gone on for a long time and there hadn't been many changes for many years. Uh, I'm very pleased to say we've already started uh, talking about next year. Uh, we've met with uh, staff from uh, Parks and Rec and, and the Commission um, and uh, talked about uh, where we saw we could make some improvements and part of that would be increasing the involvement of Burnaby Minor Hockey and uh, as some of you know we added a peewee division this year we see that the Burnaby Minor Hockey Association peewees uh, will be involved for next year so we'll have more Burnaby involvement um, and, uh, and again just uh, really enhancing uh, on, on the growth of uh, what we saw this year uh, also, we're keeping our fingers crossed, I've made uh, contacts with our friends in Kashiro to hopefully pull a team in of uh, uh, either Pee Wee or Bantam Age players from Kashiro this time around. We weren't really able to do it with, uh, with last year's tournament, but uh, we figured if we started really early and, uh, and talked to our, uh, our, our uh, hockey friends in Kashiro, that uh, this looks like a real possibility. And I think that'll even enhance it even more. So again, thank you very much to everybody. Uh, we do have a, uh, a presentation. I think uh, you're, you're gonna have to fight as to where, uh, where this token uh, of our appreciation is going to go. But it's a uh, Patman Classic uh, three medals that uh, I think would look wonderful on Eric Corgan's wall. And uh, I certainly would like to uh, thank you all for uh, being such a part of uh, this success. Thank you, everyone. Well, I, uh, if you'll just come back there for a minute, is that Councillor Dollywell would uh, like to make a comment or ask a question? <laughs> Councillor Dollywell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, I believe you answered, I punched, punched this button before you answered this question, was that I believe there is an ongoing commitment uh, from Pat Quinn Classic organization to continue with this uh, tournament for the next foreseeable future that you can think of? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the details I forgot to mention was there was a $15,000 donation to the Pat Quinn Legacy Fund uh, generated from this tournament. Uh, the Quinn family was thrilled with that level of support. They're very enthusiastic to see where this can go year over year. So certainly from the Quinn side and from the organizing committee side, there is a, a lot of enthusiasm to go year over year. Thank you, Your Worship. I, um, I, I did 
go to the tournament and, and uh, other counselors who were there as well. Um, it, uh, it seemed like it had been new life in Burnaby Minor Hockey uh, annual tournament, which uh, has been, as Larry has said, for the last going on for 50 years. It's quite difficult to let go of a tradition. I, I must say, I wasn't sure whether this was such a great idea for something which Burnaby Minor Hockey Association has proudly presented for so many years. And, and I had felt always that it isn't about how high big caliber teams are here, but rather how it engages local hockey teams. And, um, and it has done reasonably well. But over the last few years, seeing the, the numbers drop from the teams entering the tournament, uh, it, uh, it was time to really reconsider how it could be rejuvenated. And, and having 34 teams enter, plus having a name like uh, Mr. Quinn, Pat Quinn Classic, will give that um, hopefully a, a, a boost to the, the tournament uh, for the next 50 years or so. It is uh, uh, about giving uh, opportunity to those who go into the sport, uh, and it always, a tournament of any kind, raises that profile. It will attract more players, Your Worship. It will also have perhaps a little bit more engagement from parents, which I think lacks, is lacking. Uh, it's all only the players who are playing generally are seen at the rink, but for something like this, when you have teams coming from overseas and some big names, I'm certain that uh, perhaps more engagement from the parents could happen. And they'll, they'll give Burnaby Minor Hockey as well a bit of a, a sense of, of having an organization that works. So, um, but I would like to see you worship uh, Burnaby Minor Hockey's name kept middle and center to the whole organization, that this doesn't sort of become uh, a Pat Quinn only, but a minor hockey name doesn't disappear. Because after all, the city does, uh, both from a uh, resources perspective, sports that, and we wanted Burnley minor hockey to also be part of it because on the longer run, you need engagement from public, from local citizens to be part of something like this after all the tax money that we do put into it. So those are my comments, Your Worship. Uh, I look forward to having very minor hockey, be a part of that, uh, uh, engaging that Quinn family and, and, the, and the organization. Plus, of course, thank you to Tourism Burnaby uh, for taking a lead on that. Uh, I recognize it's a fair amount of work uh, to have something like organized, but also not only organized, but also part operations part of that to make sure that it's a success. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, and, uh, and I'm sure you un understand probably better than most, uh, Councillor Dollywell, that uh, Larry Hayes has been doing a very difficult job over the last years because like all organizations, it's more difficult to get the volunteers that make a tournament like this happen. And uh, parents both working can make it very difficult for people to put in the hours and hours and hours of time it takes to organize a tournament like this and to take on the responsibilities. So having a partner like Tourism Burnaby uh, really allows you to be able to grow the tournament and to be able to encourage people to come in and participate because they know that their role is going to be defined for them. They're going to know what they're supposed to do and what times they're supposed to be there. And then to have the added benefit of the Pat Quinn name attached to the tournament drew in even more people who were willing to help out. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, Burnaby resident Cliff Ronick, who was a big part of this tournament as the honorary chair and who gave it a, another element of involvement from NHL professionals. So I, I think it was just a smashing success. And I wanted to apologize to you that I wasn't able to be down there. You know that I was sick over the holidays and um, Councillor Volko took my place and I really appreciate him doing that. Um, but I, uh, I would have loved to have got a chance to see some of the uh, fantastic young players that were in this tournament, some who will be names that we will hear later on playing at a much higher level. 
almost inevitably you see kids playing in this tournament who later on become NHL stars and that's why all the scouts are there so it again is uh, a chance for anybody who hasn't been to one of these games it's a chance to be able to see the uh, the young Carl Alsners and I see his mums here today or the uh, young Nugent Hopkins you know that are are out there playing in these games and uh, and you can see that talent right at that stage that later on will do them so well. So, Councillor Way. Yeah, thanks Larry. Jennifer gave us uh, such a wonderful presentation and thanks uh, for the Manny Hockey, uh, Burley Manny Hockey Association and Tourism Burnaby to host uh, this wonderful event. I attended uh, that uh, media conference uh, in Rogers uh, Arena and also I did go for watching that uh, several games. So it's a very, very good, very, very, uh, it's big news even in the community, in the trans community. I promote this one in the social media. I will talk about this one. So as I, uh, Larry mentioned, we probably will invest in our sister city in Japan, Koshiro. As I, I mentioned, you know, in, the, in China, the Beijing, is that is also one of our famous city. Uh, they will host uh, 2022 uh, Winter Olympic Games. And uh, we can invite them to come here and even tourism Burnaby. I think uh, uh, there is a big gap, you know, for Beijing. I think they have needed to train the, uh, the, uh, those sportsmen and they need to learn a lot from uh, uh, Vancouver, Canada. So I think we can share these kind of things to them. And Manly Hockey uh, Association, they have uh, such a wonderful, you know, uh, experience we can share there. And I'm uh, currently sitting uh, in the advisory director of uh, Canada Sports uh, uh, Foundation. Uh, that is uh, uh, promoting you know, the sports exchange. So just a couple of days ago, there is uh, news in the Vancouver Sun. They mentioned about uh, Vancouver helps Beijing uh, to go for the gold. I think in Burnaby, and uh, we can do the same things. And I hope you know, we can share this and to bring more people to come to Burnaby and to learn from us. I think that's a very good uh, tournament. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there's a lot of room for growth. Uh, and uh, I certainly uh, want to uh, tell Councillor Dalliwal that uh, I certainly hear what he's saying. Um, if anybody, uh, I've told people this, if anybody was going to feel the tug of nostalgia in not letting this thing go uh, from Burnaby Minor Hockey, uh, it's probably me. And I, uh, I certainly saw it was time to make some changes. And, uh, and again, I, I still uh, feel that uh, we can work on uh, having uh, that grassroots experience still there because that's, uh, that's a big part of this event. And uh, as the mayor had said, with, uh, with seeing some future stars uh, or not, because uh, you know, all, uh, the, uh, certainly a big focus of Burnaby Minor Hockey is uh, providing recreational play. For players. Uh, this tournament, yes, it is elite, but it still, as I said in the letter from the parent, it inspires those younger kids that may never be stars. That, uh, but you'll still see their names because if you go down to the eight ranks, you'll probably see their names on the list of uh, scoring for the adult beer leagues down there. <laughs> and you know what? That is great because that's where we want to uh, try to help as well in making hockey a lifelong sport. And uh, this tournament is something that inspires uh, a lot of kids to do that. Yeah, and, uh, and the truth is that what you give them in, in minor sports does survive into adulthood. Uh, my wife and I were a couple of the only parents who were down watching uh, the 30-year-olds playing when my son and his wife were in a mixed tournament. And uh, they're still playing hockey, still loving the game, and it's something they're even doing together as a couple. So, you know, it, uh, it really is, if you learn to love the game, you continue playing it for the rest of your life. And there are people who are playing hockey up into their 80s and 90s. So, you know, it, it really is worthwhile. And sometimes we focus on the kids who are going to be stars too much, and we forget that the opportunity to be able to... Uh, to uh, play the sport, to have the camaraderie that goes with the sport and the opportunity to make the friends that you develop over the course of those years is really a big part of athletics. So I want to thank you, uh, Jennifer and Larry, for the work you did. Nancy, great job by Tourism Burnaby. You continue to uh, impress us with what you're able to do with those 
hotel tax dollars that uh, keep going back into our community. So thank you very much and again, congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. All right, um, proclamations. And I have the honor of the first proclamation and this is from the office of the mayor of the city of Burnaby. This is Canadian Oncology Nursing Day. Whereas oncology nurses are committed to providing quality oncology care, and whereas oncology nurses have demonstrated excellence in patient care, teaching, research, administration, and education in the field of oncology nursing, and whereas oncology nurses endeavor to educate the public in the prevention and treatment of cancer. Now therefore, I, Derek R. Corrigan, Mayor Burnaby, do hereby proclaim April the 5th, 2016, as Canadian Oncology Nursing Day in the city of Burnaby. And the next proclamation is going to be read by Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Your Worship, regarding uh, National Organ and Tissue Donation Awareness Week. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, whereas there are currently just under 500 people in BC waiting for an organ transplant and more than 5,000 British Columbians that have already received the gift of life through organ donations since 1968, and whereas there is an increasing need to raise awareness of the shortage of organ donors and to acknowledge the families that demonstrate their compassion by sharing the precious gift of life with others, and whereas there are volunteer groups within our community, like the BC Region of Canadian Transplant Association, that are dedicated to the support of pre- and post transplant patients and to informing the public of the need for organ and tissue donation. Now, therefore, yourself, Mayor Derek Corgan, does hereby proclaim the week of April 17th to 24th, 2016, as National Organ and Tissue Donation Awareness Week in the City of Burnaby. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. And the last proclamation is going to be read by Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Worship. From the Office of the Mayor of the City of Burnaby, National Volunteer Week, whereas 12.7 million Canadians volunteers, 12.7 million Canadian volunteers give their time to help others, contributing close to 2 billion volunteer hours per year, and whereas volunteers are the roots of a strong community, nourish our lives with their skills and talents, and whereas Burnaby volunteers are students, families, self-employed, retirees, new immigrants, all connecting to the people and places where they live, and whereas through volunteering, people also become rooted to their community with the result that Burnaby is a more desirable place to live. Now, therefore, Derek R. Corrigan, Mayor of Burnaby, does hereby proclaim April 10th to 16th as National Volunteer Week in the city of Burnaby. Thank you very much, Councillor Jordan. Now a motion to adopt the minutes of the open council meeting held on March the 21st, 2016. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any uh, discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Motion to adopt the minutes of the public hearing zoning held on March the 29th, 2016. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, opposed, and carry. Uh, motion to resolve into a committee of the whole to consider reports. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carry. The first is from the Executive Committee of Council, and uh, it is the Kashiro Cup Award for the 2015 Outstanding Citizen of the Year, Mr. George Kawaguchi. Councillor Dollywell, did you want to speak to this? Yes, Your Worship. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, just on behalf of the committee, Your Worship, I uh, wish to move to receive this report for information purposes. Thank you. Um, Your Worship, uh, very quickly, um, I would like to uh, just mention a couple of things about uh, Mr. Kawaguchi. He's a long-term Burnaby resident, Your Worship, and uh, he has started uh, volunteering in Burnaby in 1974, and he has been continuously involved with uh, many, many different things. There are actually quite a few to enumerate here. 
I will leave that, Your Worship, for you to, uh, to expand on when we have this uh, 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 cup presented to Mr. Kawaguchi at the uh, appreciation dinner on May the 6th. But it suffices to say, Your Worship, uh, that his accomplishments are uh, quite extensive, and he has been very willing and able and ready to serve when asked to help and in fact uh, many times and mostly volunteers for a lot of organization worship. The committee is very pleased to put his name <laughs> over your worship uh, uh, for Mr. Ka George Kawaguchi to be bestowed the Kishiro Cup Award. Your worship. Thank you very much uh, and Councillor McDonnell. Your worship, it, uh, I had the pleasure of working side by side with George during the seniors games. I'd known him before that and uh, he was untireless tire there, he just wouldn't stop. I thought to myself, you know, if I had a business, this is the type of person I'd want working for me. Because if he can do this in a volunteer position, I can imagine what he'd do if he get paid. But the other thing that impressed me about George over the years was you never heard him talk about all the different things he was involved in. He just did them. So he wasn't out there bragging or anything else, he just seen a need and he filled that need. And you know, the citizens like that to make Burnaby such a great place. And uh, I, I feel lucky to, uh, to know George and have him as a friend. So I can't find anybody more deserving this year than George to get this award. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I can remember meeting George when uh, I first became a member of the South Burnaby Men's Club. And uh, George and I both uh, worked at changing the name of the club because it didn't reflect who was doing all the work. Uh, and as a result, uh, we managed to keep the initials on all our soccer balls by changing the name to the South Burnaby Metro Club. And it has uh, had that name for a very long time. And I know that George was very proud of being the president when that name change was made because it was a sign of uh, progress into the future. And uh, George was a tremendous ally to the Metro Club working as a baseball coach and a soccer coach as the president and he, he just was one of those tireless workers as you've said and he went on and worked with the Canada Summer Games, he worked with the Michael uh, J. Fox Theater Society, worked with the seniors uh, games when they came to Burnaby. He continues to work with organizations like PADS and, and works uh, on, uh, on projects like the uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation annual run that uh, I attend and you know he, he is one of those people who just gives back very quietly to the community on an ongoing basis and as far as I'm concerned he epitomizes good citizenship in our in our city and uh, I know that uh, when I phoned George and let him know that uh, this award uh, was coming forward to council George was uh, he was a little surprised and I, I, I told him you shouldn't be surprised you've had a lifetime of service you've had 40 years of service and at some point you needed to be recognized for what you've been able to accomplish and he said you know that wasn't why I did it is that I didn't do it because I wanted to be recognized for it I just did, did it because it needed to be done and uh, and I had the time and the energy to do it and uh, I know that he is going to be a very popular recipient uh, this year. So congratulations to George Kawaguchi on being the Kishiro Cup winner, the Citizen of the Year, and I couldn't think of a more worthy person to receive that award. All right, you ready uh, for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. The next report is from the Financial Management Committee, Councilor Johnson. Your Worship, this is regarding a lease agreement at two 088 Madison Avenue and I move the recommendation. Your Worship, this uh, report arises out of the amenity bonus project on Lohi Highway at Madison. Uh, I believe it's the Renaissance Towers. Uh, about 10 years ago when this building was completed, uh, Council um, awarded the amenity space to uh, Bocce, which is the Burnaby Association for Community Inclusion. And this report that's before us is for a uh, renewal of that lease. All right, it's been moved. Uh, is there a seconder? 
moved and seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Next item, Your Worship, is regarding 2016 gaming interest and stabilization funding request, and I would move the recommendation. Second. And this is for uh, $4 million from operating gaming fund and $3.6 million from stabilization for 2016 projects. Uh, Your Worship, the report that's before us is a good news item. Uh, these are projects that um, are suggested to be done and some of them are underway. Uh, on behalf of the citizens of Burnaby and the city, these are um, major projects that are being funded out of surplus, which is the residual from last year's tax uh, draw, plus the uh, use of gaming fund interest. Now, for those that aren't aware of gaming fund interest, the gaming fund interest arises from the profits that are uh, gleaned at the casino at the villa. Uh, we uh, receive a small portion of the uh, gaming uh, bottom line, and this, these funds are uh, made available by the city for one-time use projects that uh, we can enhance the community without uh, placing a burden on the taxpayer. None of these projects are coming out of tax dollars. We're looking at 4.016 million of various projects around the city. They're everything from uh, the, the uh, horticulture sh uh, events at Tommy Douglas Library. We're looking at road, some road maintenance. We're looking at uh, Canada Day festivities, Burnaby Blues Festival, uh, golf course shrub improvements, and the list goes on. The, uh, again, it's a, it's a good news item report. These are projects that are on top of what the taxpayers are paying for, and they're being funded out of, uh, funded out of uh, gaming profits. Thank you. You ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Next, Your Worship, is, uh, is a report regarding assessment averaging, and I would move that Council not implement property tax averaging, given that it redistributes the tax burden from higher-valued properties to lower-valued properties in a given year. Your Worship, uh, arising out of a piece of correspondence from Minister Fassbender, uh, Council and the Finance Committee asked staff for a report on the feasibility of whether or not, as the Minister suggested, that we should offer tax averaging uh, for properties based on property tax assessments. The report that's before us uh, clearly indicates that it's not a good idea in that it, uh, it might lower the people at the top of the uh, assessment, but it would actually redistribute that burden down towards the uh, lower priced properties in the city, which uh, would be inequitable to them. It's basically creating one problem with by fi fixing one problem by creating a problem somewhere else. Uh, I think the report that's before us is pretty clear. Um, it is used in Vancouver, but I don't think it would be in the best interest of Burnaby taxpayers to do it here. Questions called? Oh, wait, Councillor Balco. I just thought I'd first send a copy of this to the Minister of Finance or the uh, Minister of Community Sport and whatever whatever else is in that basket of his. Shouldn't we send him a copy of this thing? He sent us a letter, we generated a report. Sure. NRMLA, you make the amendment and NRML, uh, NRMLAs, I guess, would be happy to see this too, so I'd make that amendment. All right, to send to Minister Fassbender and to the four MLAs in Burnaby, is that right? Yeah. Is there a seconder for that amendment? Second. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. As On the motion as amended, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. Management Committee is regarding Burnaby Farmers Market at City Hall and the motion recommendation is that Council authorize staff to enter a license agreement valued at $75 with the Artisan Farmers Market Society to operate a weekly market in the City Hall North parking lot for the 2016 summer season as outlined in the report. Your Worship, this is a renewal of the existing uh, operating agreement with the uh, Artisan Society and uh, it will mean that we have fresh vegetables available on the weekends. And wine. Oh, that's and true. Wine. True. All right. It's been moved, seconded. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. There's and now more. Planning and Development Committee. Councillor Jordan. One, there's one more. Oh, sorry. Is there another sorry. one? Did I yeah, miss one? Yeah, there's one more. 
Uh, you were so this is regarding uh, they're kind of out oh of order. yeah this is an important one. This is regarding BC homeowner grant program, and I would move that council request the UBCM to petition the Minister of Finance to undertake a provincial review of the homeowner grant program to determine if a more equitable distribution of the grant across all regions of the province can be achieved. Second. Your Worship, uh, council is aware of the. Uh, the chaos that the current uh, real estate market and high assessments are, are causing across the Lower Mainland. Uh, we're finding that uh, people that have had a, a sustainable uh, homeowners grant over the last many years are finding that due to the increased assessments that their their uh, property their uh, grant is actually shrinking and and um, and declining. The uh, report that's before us um, sets out of several ways, and I think Councillor Jordan's going to talk to the specifics of, the, of the, what's available out there. But this is a, uh, uh, it shows that, in fact, there is a real inequity between Lower Mainland and Northern BC. There are all sorts of incentives for those that live in the lower priced property regions of the province versus those of us that live in the Lower Mainland. And it's actually sh the burden of, of benefit is shifting to the er to the rural area, and the, uh, the the tax bill is is shifting to the lower mainland. The um, the report that's before us uh, sets out um, the impacts. Uh, there's there's just it's just um, amazing the the uh, implications that that we're finding the. Uh, the Property owners living in the in the region regional district of Greater Vancouver Regional District and the Capital Regional District and Fraser Valley Regional District are entitled to claim a basic grant of $570 and $845 if you're 65 or older. These grants have not changed since 2006 and are less than those provided in the north and rural areas. The province defines a northern and rural area of the property that is located outside the Greater Vancouver Regional District, Capital Regional District, or Fraser Valley Regional District, these properties are eligible for an addition for, of a grant of $770. Eligible seniors would, would, would go to $1,045. Uh, if a homeowner meets all the requirements of the homeowner's grant but their property's assessment value or petition value is over the threshold of the region, they may qualify for a homeowner's grant at a reduced amount. So basically, as the value of the assessments are rising, the threshold is lowering, so we're finding that less and less people are el eligible to get the full grant. Yet in the north we have, I mean, the east of the lower mainland, we have people that are getting uh, excess grants that are greater than their, than their tax payable. We're asking the uh, province to look at this situation and uh, come back with a more equitable system. Thank you, uh, Councillor Johnson. And if the other speakers don't mind, I'll let uh, Councillor Jordan yeah. speak to the matter because I know that uh, a lot of research. She did a lot of work on this. So, Councillor McDonnell, with your permission, Councillor Jordan. Um, oh, Councillor Dollywell will come after that after Councillor Jordan. Councillor Jordan. You're on. I'm on? I'm on. Oh, I'm Thank you. Um, thank you, Worship. And I want to thank our, our staff for this report. When, when Minister Fassbender responded to our request uh, back before Christmas that, that we should freeze the property tax assessments in order to basically have an opportunity to get a grip on what the impact of this was going to be around around this region in particular, um, you know, but others in the province as well. Uh, when we got the letter back from him, uh, the staff were in the process of getting together some of those details about what the impact would be on Burnaby. And the committee um, um, looked at some of those implications, again, that are reflected in this report specifically about Burnaby. But then we started to look beyond <laughs> Burnaby's own borders. And, you know, 
I guess property, well, any kind of taxation policy is complicated, and they do that on purpose, right? But it seems like property tax is more complicated than most. And even in a letter to the editor just a, a couple of weeks ago in the Burnaby Now, uh, someone wrote in basically saying that the city of Burnaby was going to be reaping a huge profit because we didn't have to pay a homeowner grant anymore uh, to all these people who had lost the grant through the increase in the assessments. And this is somebody who proudly said that they had been paying taxes in Burnaby for 30 years. But that person doesn't realize homeowner grant has nothing to do with the city. The homeowner grant is a part of the tax bill that the province uh, provides in order to reduce the impact of the school uh, property tax that we collect on their behalf, right? So, so I tried to uh, correct that uh, in, the, in the letter to the Burnaby Now, but as we started to sort of peel back the layers of this onion, and we were looking at what Minister Fassbender did say about increasing the thresholds, we started to realize that the province had been upping the threshold, downing the threshold, moving the threshold, changing the threshold, and that there was a whole bunch of uh, things happening there uh, that impacted especially Burnaby and Vancouver that in those areas where the higher assessments are. And then we looked at the fact that the homeowner grant has not increased since 2006. So it used to increase almost every year, if not every second year at the, at the most. And, the, and but in 10 years, there's been no increase, even though assessments have, for a long time, gradually raised. So, so we started to look again and peel back and look more, um, more closely at this. And then we found this anomaly, which, which uh, Councillor Johnson pointed out, where in 2011, um, well, actually in 2009, just before the election, the province introduced something called the Northern and Rural Homeowners Benefit Program, where they pay $200 extra to every, to everyone entitled to a homeowner grant, they get $200 extra. And so, you know, okay, well, what's Northern and Rural? Fort St. John, Farms, right? That's what you would think. And trust me, it is not easy to find the definition of northern and rural. You have to peel back some more layers of some more onions. Right? And the staff had to phone Victoria because they couldn't even find out what the definition was. This is a major piece of provincial tax policy. 400,000 homes get this $200 extra homeowner grant and we couldn't find out who those were until you find, buried deep underneath you find what the definition is and it's anything outside Vancouver, Victoria and the Fraser Valley regional districts. So those three districts, so Kelowna, West Kelowna, Whistler, Prince George, Nanaimo are northern and rural, right? And everyone who lives there, including I checked with my friend in Nanaimo, he sent me a copy of his tax it. Northern and Rural Benefit is extra $200. So this has been going on since 2011. It's cost the government $350 million to spread this benefit to everybody outside the Lower Mainland. And it's paid for by the carbon tax. So we in the Lower Mainland, I'm sure at least, pay more than half the carbon tax that's collected in the province. But that money is taken and redistributed. There are a bunch of socialists, these people in Victoria. They redistribute the wealth generated from the carbon tax to the northern and rural area via this $200 homeowner benefit. So it's, um, and again, that has further implications because the thresholds have to be higher. So the threshold for losing your, car, your total homeowner grant is $200 higher in West Kelowna than it is in Burnaby. So Councillor Volko, who's become rather famous for the fact that he lost his grant this year, went from full grant to 
I calculated for him, he's going to get $12, right? So, so he always got a $12 grant. A similarly priced and assessed home in West Kelowna will get a $145 grant. And I've got a picture of a similarly priced home in West Kelowna, <laughs> similar to Councillor of All Coast. It's, it's kind of the reverse. The home in Kelowna is a million dollar house on a $300,000 $300, piece of property. He has a million dollar piece of property with a $300,000 house, right? $30 house? <laughs> anyway, you, you get my point, right? So. So the whole thing about property tax fairness is a real uh, eye-opener and it's a very difficult policy area to understand. I appreciate that our staff tried and succeeded well in just putting out the facts, ma'am. They didn't add the um, political spin that I'm doing now. But the reality is, is that in this city, the, we will have less than 80% of People get a homeowner's grant where it's supposedly the provincial average is 91. 4,000 people who got a grant last year will not get one this year. And meanwhile, the government is providing extra grant money to areas outside the region. That's not fair. Um, I'm not saying we should take it away from Kelowna. I'm just saying if you're going to have a tax policy, it should apply to the whole province, not one section of the province versus the other. So I'm happy to uh, support this report, appreciate the work that's gone into it, and to try to explain simply and to people so that they may understand uh, what this all means because it's, uh, it's, it's a real sham. It's gone on for four years. Oh, and the reason the government said they did it back in 2011 was because the interior was having a tough time recovering from the 08 you know, economic crisis. Well, from all I hear out of Victoria these days, we're number one in the, in the country. So continuing to subsidize these regions from this method doesn't make any sense from a policy perspective anymore at all. My rant. Thank you. <laughs> well, they, they um, and they said to the Mayor's Council when they asked for just a little bit of the carbon tax money to to deal with transit issues here and the opportunity to uh, to improve the transit system they said no way we're not having the rest of British Columbia subsidize your transit system <laughs> so, well well we're giving them all 200 bucks extra 80, 83 million for the household portion there's also a portion which the government uh, forgives major industry 60% of their school tax, only major industry, that costs another 24 million a year out of the carbon tax. And guess how many major industry um, places are in the Lower Mainland? 2% of the province. So again, it's all the... 98% you know, are, are outside the Lower Mainland. So all that carbon tax money again is taken from here and given to the major industry outside the region. If this doesn't outrage people, what will? Councillor Dollywell. I pass, Your Worship. Councillor McDonnell. The, uh, one of the things that uh, didn't get many headlines is when the government of the day reduced the top end for losing your homeowners grant when it was at 1.2 million and they took it back down to 1 million and then they put 100,000 back and then they're bragging about this year they've increased it another 100,000 but that put it back to what it was 30 months ago so I mean we're back to where it was 30 months ago but two years ago the average increase in North Burnaby was running right around the 18 to 20 percent increase and this past year it was running 30 percent so when you look at the price of the houses jumping over there, and uh, I went over, there was a group of citizens who were quite concerned and were uh, over outside of the assessment office, and I went over to talk to them to support them. <coughs> and I know that seniors have the opportunity to defer their taxes. Um, they can do that uh, and that, but uh, the people there, there was only two that were seniors. The rest were working people. And they said, because of this inflated 
market we're in, my property's gone up close to half a million dollars in the last two years. Now, I'm being assessed at that for my property tax, and it's gone up accordingly. Our school taxes have gone up accordingly. But they didn't do anything. I mean, because some house sold on the block, then everybody in the block gets assessed to the same. So the balance isn't there. And, and several of them said, we're going to have to sell. We just cannot afford to keep going this way with the taxes, with the increase in, in medical premiums, the increase in ICBC, all these different sleuth taxes that are nailing us on. I just can't afford to hold on to this. And you've got to remember, this is when we're talking 3% mortgages. I can remember this is the third time I've seen this skyrocketing prices in my history. And I can remember that we went from myself personally on that big piece of land I had out in the valley from 9% to 23% in the year runaway years before they brought in the wage and price controls. And it just killed everybody. But 1% increase, a lot of people when they come up for renewal will have a tough time renewing their mortgages. So, I mean, a lot of them got into it, and they could make it, but they can't make it when everything else is going up around them, and then they keep getting gouged. The other thing, too, is when you look at the school tax being collected in the province, the vast majority is being collected down here, which doesn't get the increase in the homeowners' grants. So we're paying not only for our schools that we're not getting done around the lower mainland, is we're also subsidizing the school's interior. Now, I don't blame the people that own the property there, I blame the policy of the government for making it that way. I mean, why should it be any cheaper to send your child to school in a place outside of greater Vancouver or Victoria area than it does in those areas? Because usually those areas, the cost is more for those schools because the population is smaller, but they've got to have them. They've got to have the bus system to get the kids back and forth to schools. So it's not only that we're below the threshold of 91% that are that are uh, getting the homeowner's grant. We're down around 78% of my numbers are right. It's also in the school tax, we're paying proportionally a lot more than other parts of the province. And this government just seems to get away with it. Nobody sits there. They blame the closest government, which is municipalities and that. They think it's all their fault. But it's, it's the policies of the provincial government that's causing this chaos right now. And we've got people that are moving. They just can't afford to hang on here in Burnaby. And these are people who have been here for a long time. And not all of them have that luxury if they want. And a lot of them, because of the way they were brought up, they don't want to have debt. So they don't like deferring their taxes, even though it's the best thing to do because the inflation is, is uh, much higher on the property than it is on their taxes. So that at the end of the day, they'll still come out ahead. But I don't know if you heard on the radio today, March set an all-time record for sales in B.C., it broke every existing record. They have nothing came close to the number of homes sold. So come July 1st this year, the assessments are going to take another big jump. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's higher than what it was last year because so far there's been nothing to dampen this. So the assessment value is going up. If we keep going this way, half the people are going to be, won't be able to stay here anymore. And then what are we going to do? We've got to get some changes. We've got to get some realistic ideas and a policy that works for everybody. Not for a select few. Thank you. Councillor Balco. I just, uh, I, I just wanted to thank, I know how hard uh, Councillor Jordan has worked on this and staff and uh, I mean it's an eye opener for me, uh, Mr. Mayor, you were saying uh, what does it take for people to, uh, to come to the realization of what's going on but uh, you know I mean uh, we're, uh, I, I would gather under this, this uh, formula and, and this uh, definition that Whistler is probably a rural Everybody up in uh, up in Whistler, so poor old folks up there. But um, just on a process on the recommendations here, I see that it's going to the UBCM to petition the Minister of Finance. And again, I don't know on the timeliness of uh, of um, of how we get this out. But I know when I go to UBCM conventions and that, I know that the uh, smaller rural communities are appreciative of the reports that we circulate from here. Now, whether they'll be happy with this report might be a different matter, but. I, I do think that uh, at least here within uh, within the lower mainland or or, or uh, Victoria and uh, uh, well yeah lower mainland and Victoria that if we could uh, if we could send this out 
to at least those folks. I don't know. I, I, I think rural communities would be happy to take a look at this too. I mean, this carbon tax fiasco uh, scam, I call it, uh, impacts them as, as well as it does us. So would it make sense to circulate this to all the members of the UBCM and also to the Minister of Finance uh, in regards to this and our MLAs? I think it's a great report and I think it should be shared around. Yeah, I don't know what the MPs care about this. I, um, I don't have any problem with it being widely disseminated. I, I expect it will be because I, I expect people will be uh, catching up on it. And uh, I don't really care if people in northern and rural um, BC don't like this report. It's unfair. Yeah. And what they're doing is unfair. And we need to bring that issue forward. It's unfair that we're paying carbon taxes here to be able to support big industrial complexes in the rest of British Columbia and people who are living in Whistler as being northern and rural. I imagine what they're saying out in Chilliwack where they actually are rural about the fact that they got included with the lower mainland. Yeah. So I... I it's astounding. Councillor Johnson. Worship, uh, similar to that, I was going to actually suggest that we send it to the Capital Regional District, the Fraser Valley Regional District, and Metro Vancouver. I think the municipality is good, but I think the these regional bodies have, some of them are elected independently from municipalities, so I think it would be good to include those. I just wanted to, to uh, point out one thing that, that I think is important. This is a sham, and it needs to be addressed. But I think we need to uh, clarify something in the public size too though. The assessment structure is a methodology of allocating taxes. We have a budget. It's the same budget whether the assessments went up or down. It just means that because the assessments changed, those people that got ridiculously high assessments are going to pay a ridiculously high proportion of the total tax bill where previously they would have paid a lower percentage of that tax bill. And because of that, other people that would have paid a higher amount are going to pay slightly less because they've, they've uh, jimmied the proportions around. It's really not an equitable process, but every once in a while you hear, and some of our neighboring municipalities perpetuate this because they don't seem to understand the issue either, that when the, the assessments and the tax bill are two different things. and. The fact that the assessments went up doesn't mean that we get to collect more in the city of Burnaby. We collect the same dollar that we would have collected had the taxes not, had the assessments not changed. It's just somebody gets screwed and somebody gets a benefit. Yeah, it's just how it's proportioned uh, for us. But there is no doubt that the government has served its own interests exactly. by looking to areas where the Liberal government has been elected in northern British Columbia in order to provide them with additional benefits and taking it out of the carbon tax. The That's heartland. unquestionable. And, uh, and I don't know how they relate that to the greening of British Columbia. The idea that the carbon tax should be helping us get greener. Well, the only thing that's getting greener is donations to the Liberal Party. So I have no idea how they're, they're justifying this as being an appropriate use of the carbon tax. But it is, a, as you said, it is a sham. All right, uh, with that, hopefully people out in, in Burnaby are going to be just as outraged as we are about this and that uh, the MLAs are going to hear about it and the Premier is going to hear about it uh, because I, I think it's absolutely atrocious that they would be taking money out of the lower mainland in our carbon tax and handing it out to, well, West Kelowna. And I don't know who the MLA is in West Kelowna, but... There you go. There you go. All right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Moving on now. Yeah, we'll circulate it wildly, widely, wildly and widely. All right, the next report, Planning and Development Committee, Councillor Jordan, please.
this is so boring. <laughs> uh, the recommendation from the committee is that council authorize initiation of a consultation process to explore the desirability of an R12 area zoning for the 3570, 3650, 3670, 3690 uh, blocks of Douglas Road or addresses of Douglas Road and 5628 Hardwick Street and that a copy of this report to be sent to Mr. Pagnani, the petition organizer at Phillips Avenue, Burnaby. And I so move. And this, Your Worship, Council is aware, is consult community consultation about the potential for um, rezoning to R12. All right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed and carry. And the next from the committee has to do with the city lands program for non-market housing projects, priorities and guidelines. And the recommendation is that council approve the recommended request for expressions of the interest, guidelines and processes as outlined in section four of this report. And I so move. Second. And your worship, this is uh, phase two of the program that the committee brought forward and was supported by council back in November of last year. And this is the plan to use our community benefit uh, bonus housing fund monies to offer city properties for development in non-market rental housing. And so this is the next phase, as I noted, of that process. And we'll be asking uh, through various means uh, for expressions of interest from either nonprofits, government agencies, etc., out there who may um, be interested in taking the opportunity of developing the two properties that we've announced at this time. And, and this lays out the criteria on uh, what we're looking for and uh, what pro possible proponents should consider if they think they would uh, like to take advantage of this opportunity. So. Uh, if council supports this policy tonight, it will be, this information will be distributed in the uh, development, not, proper, not for profit housing communities, et cetera, and to see just exactly what may be uh, interest there is out there. Uh, we're happy to note that potentially the, the new federal government may have some additional financial opportunities that might spur this process along as well. So. So this is very good timing on, on our behalf and hopefully coinciding with what the government is in, in, um, talking about doing in terms of increasing the non-market rental housing supply within the region. So I'm happy to move this on behalf of the committee to the next step. Thank you and hopefully we'll get some good responses that will address that issue. But again, it's uh, an issue of trying to create non-market housing through non, not-for-profits so uh, or at least affordable housing. Hopefully we're going to be able to get some applications that will qualify although there's a paucity of funds available at this stage. Uh, the, the new initiatives by the uh, federal government haven't yet come into play but uh, they may be an option that, that is available sooner or later. All right, you ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, and carry. All right, moving on to the city manager's report. This is the water sh shortage response plan, and this informs council of the amendments approved by Metro Vancouver uh, to the water shortage response plan and seeks approval on incorporating the amendments to the city's water works regulation bylaw. Councillor Kang. Thank you, Worship. Um, the topic of water always gets me very excited and um, I just wanted to just highlight the key amendments that was approved by Metro Vancouver Board and um, it's extending the activation period of phase one um, of the water response plan from starting from June this year uh, to September 30th and um, also allowing water to be used by commercial cleaning services for aesthetic cleaning during stage two and as well um, for during stage two, allowing local governments to issue permits for uh, watering new lawns or for treatment of control of European Schaefer beetle to remain valid during stage three. Because I remembered um, last year we had um, a problem of uh, 
of uh, European shapers on our lawns and people bought shaper beetles and thought that they weren't allowed to use them where in fact um, uh, our permits allowed them to water their lawns. Um, but this is also a great time for us to start thinking about water conservation um, now being April and you know what they say is April showers, is that April showers? April showers bring May flowers and we haven't seen quite a bit of um, rain showers just yet but this just reminds us of how important it is to really conserve water early. Um, I was looking at our website and um, we do have lots of information on ways that we could conserve water. So our website is burnby.ca. As well, every year we do promote that uh, we have rain barrels and they could be purchased at the city's echo center. As well, if you're wondering what uh, rain barrels do, we do present them during our um, environment festival, now two weeks of environment festival, and you could take a look at them at the Echo Center or during our festival. Um, one of the things, one of the quotes that I always take to heart is, is a poster that I saw when I was a little girl. If a man does not conserve water, then the last drop will be his tears. And, um, you know, c coming to see how our icebergs have melted and the shortage of water that we have every year, um, I do not want our last drop of water to be my tears. Um, but also thinking about the rain barrel, brown was the new green during the summer season. But you could always gloat that you have the greenest lawn if you have a water barrel and you could water your lawn throughout uh, phase two if it does so happen this year. So I want to encourage everyone to start thinking about water conservation, um, thinking about uh, small changes you could do in your lifestyle in terms of the biggest usage in your bathroom, in your kitchen, your laundry, um, talking about it with your family, especially with your kids and um, what that would look like and an impact to you and to environment and in a bigger picture to, to your um, province. So um, this, this report just brings forth lots of thoughts of what I could do to talk about water to, to my community. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Councillor Kang. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Worship. Uh, just to make one small correction, the, uh, the water restrictions actually are from May 15th to October 15th. Uh, there was a little, I think the way the paragraphs were worded, it's a bit confusing. Um, I just was going to comment similar to Councillor Kang. The, um, I was in a garden shop on the weekend and they're actually starting to stock varieties of grass that need lower water over the summer. So I think we're starting to get into a, a mindset that water may be short and could be very easily short uh, in, in the coming years. So I think uh, we're starting to see plants and, and grasses that are actually going to accommodate that. So I think that's a really good thing. I need grass that eats chafer beetles. <laughs> Councillor Jordan. Let's not talk about crows, okay? Um, anyways, as a member of the Metro Utilities Committee, I just wanted to say that the changes that are being implemented this year are, are the ones that the committee found from last year to be very emergent and should really be um, dealt with immediately. But there's a whole total review of that, of that program that's ha happening and ongoing with input from the cities, um, members of the committee, the communities, and all kinds of stakeholders. And, and that will bring a sort of total new um, program out this time next year or before this time next year so people have time to prepare because last summer's experience really impacted and hurt some people um, more so than, than others and they're trying to make a, a better communications program and a better way of people understanding um, the reasons behind all of this, etc. So there's a whole mass of we look at that of that program uh, happening and that will continue through this summer and into next year before there's final review of the total regulation. Great, thank you. You ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item two. This is to obtain council approval to award a construction contract for the 2016 sanitary lateral inspection and grouting project. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item three is rezonings. 
And we have the first rezoning item one. This is 7349 Gilly Avenue, and this is to permit the construction of a ground-oriented townhouse development with one level of underground parking. This is authorization to uh, work with the proponent and to send copies to neighboring owners. Great. You ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item two. This is 6909, 6915, 6921, and 6931 Balmoral Street. This is to permit the construction of a three-story ground-oriented townhouse development with one level of underground parking. Similarly, this is authorization to uh, continue to work with the applicant and to send uh, a notice to the owner of 6939 Balmoral. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carry. Item three. This is 1010 Sperling Avenue, and this is to permit the conversion of underutilized common space to a two-bedroom suite in an existing supportive housing development, and this is authorization to work with the proponent. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 4. This is 7770 North Fraser Way, and this is to permit the construction of a multi-tenant office and light industrial building, and this is authorization to work uh, with the proponent towards a public hearing. All right, this question has been called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 5. This is 1431 Sperling Avenue, and this is to permit the subdivision of the site into uh, two-family residential lots, two two-family residential lots, and this is authorization to work with the applicant. Question has been called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 6. This is 4380 Halifax Street, and this is to permit installation of a rooftop antenna and ancillary radio equipment. Authorization to work with the applicant to the preparation of a suitable plan. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 7. This is 8125 North Fraser Way. This is to permit the expansion of the existing facilities warehouse area. This is authorization to work with the proponent. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 8. This is 3249 and 3355 North Road. This is the, to permit the construction of two multifamily residential towers and an office mid-rise atop a commercial and townhouse podium. And this is authorization to work with the applicant. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 9. This is 3433 North Road. This is to permit a small addition of commercial floor area generated by enclosing an existing covered building entranceway. And this is authorization to work with the applicant towards a suitable plan of development. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 10. This is a portion of 7201 11th Avenue, Island 6. This is to permit construction of a 40-story residential tower with a two-story townhouse podium in the island neighborhood within the Southgate Master Plan area. This is authorization to work with the applicant. Questions, Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 11. This is 7419 Britain Street. This is to permit construction of a four-unit infill townhouse development with that grade parking. And uh, this is a copy of the report be sent to the property owners on 18th Avenue and authorization to work with the applicant towards a suitable plan of development. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 12. This is a portion of 7201 11th Avenue, Island 345. This is to permit construction of a 28-story residential tower and two four-story low-rise residential buildings in the island neighborhood within the Southgate Master Plan area, authorization to work with the applicant. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 13. This is 3755 McGill Street. This is to permit the installation of a rooftop 
antenna and ancillary radio equipment. This is authorization to work with the applicant. Councillor Buffalo. I'm, uh, I'm just a curious sort. I wasn't going to say anything on the first one. I saw the one that uh, on uh, Halifax Street, but I, I'm just curious. Maybe a memo just to just to uh, ease my curiosity. I, I would, I'm wondering what the relationship is between Cypress Land Services and Ecom. Why is Ecom not making the application, and why is there this third party making <coughs> an application on behalf of Ecom? I don't, I don't, I don't need an answer tonight. But I mean, if I can just get a, uh, you know, because we're always talking about Ecom and charges, and municipalities worry about costs and all of this, and so I don't understand it. if there's if these applications are all over the place. Why is an Ecom just coming forward with their staff making an application and be done with it? But Cypress Land Services, I, I'm just wondering what the relationship is between the two. Just curious. Elche, is that easy to answer right now, or would you like time? Your, your Worship, we can provide a memo, but all right. the uh, company is uh, who Ecom has hired to do this particular service for them. It's a development activity. It's not something that Ecom staff themselves would be familiar with or would be negotiating with property owners for siting of the equipment on a rooftop. It's more working with the property owners as opposed and to the, working with us. And the design of the installation, the roof membranes, that sort of thing. Yeah. All right. Ready for the question? All those in favor, opposed, carried. Item 14. This is 7388 Kingsway, and this is to permit commercial use and parking adjustments to the approved comprehensive development zoning. This is authorization to work with the applicant. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Item 15. This is 9411 and 9755 University Crescent. This is to transfer residential density potential from 9411 University Crescent to 9755 University Crescent from uh, construction of an expanded community park at 9411 University Crescent and permit construction of a low-rise apartment building, three townhouse buildings, and underground parking at 9755 University Crescent. And this is authorization to work with the applicant. Questions called. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. And all of these are reports that, in essence, give us notice that these are some of the projects that are in line with the planning department and uh, to let us know that they will be coming back with further reports. All right, with that, a motion to rise and report. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. A motion to report of the committee be adopted. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Councillor Dollywell, bylaws, please. Your Worship, I move, a first reading, I move that bylaw number 13569. 13584, 13585, 13586, 13587, 13588, 13589 be now introduced and read the first time. Been moved and seconded. Seeing no speakers, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. First, second, and third reading. I move that bylaw number 13590 be now introduced and read three times. Moved and seconded. Seeing no speakers, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. Second reading, I move that bylaw numbers 13576, 13577, 13578, 13579 be now read a second time. Second. Moved and seconded. No discussion. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Reconsideration and final adoption, I move that bylaw number 13583. Be now be considered and finally adopted, signed by the mayor and clerk, and the corporate seal affects there too. Seeing no speakers, all those in favor, opposed, and carried. That's as you wish it. Thank you. Uh, any new business? All right. Motion to adjourn is in order. A seconder, please. All those in favor, opposed, and carried. Thank you very much to uh, staff and council, and thank you to everyone who was with us tonight.